Do you have any uh, question whatsoever, Mr. Reed, uh, that there was no communication uh, at all between um, uh, Americans and Afghans that would have in any way jeopardized or compromised that mission? No, sir, I do not have any questions that that information was provided. I know from those involved that this particular 17 mission was not coordinated externally. Is it your testimony here today that uh, the aircraft that was uh, selected for this operation was appropriate to the mission? Yes, sir. Were there insulting remarks made by an Afghan cleric there? Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman. The three people spoke at the ceremony that you're asking about. At the, we call it a, it's a memorial service. The, the troops call it a ramp ceremony. We make a distinction in policy between ceremonies and services, but they call it a ramp ceremony, and they've been doing them the whole war. And it's an important, and if I may, I'll get to that. The question was asked earlier about why we do that. This, the, the troops are in the battlefield, and they're continuing the fight. They don't come back for uh, to see their lo their loved comrades off. So that's their farewell. Uh, they are filmed, and they're filmed for the purpose of providing those to the families. They're filmed by that organization at the commander's discretion uh, at that time within policy. As you heard, the policy has been changed by CENTCOM in, in 2013. Um, but they're done so for the families, and they provide that to them. Uh, as, a, as a memento of what they did uh, downrange. Three people spoke. The commander of our Special Operations Task Force, a U.S. military chaplain, and the third gentleman that gets to your question is an Afghan. He's a colonel. He's the commander of the Afghan unit that we work with. He's been working with us in a very trusted, close, and cooperative way uh, for several years. I believe now he's still there. It started, I believe, in 2009. Uh, he uh, accounts for those special troops that are assigned to our task force. And as I mentioned, they come out of the other forces. We run a special selection and a vetting and a training program for them. He's the one that spoke. Uh, there's no other one that spoke. I'm not a, uh, I don't speak Arabic. I'm not a religious scholar. We have had people in our government listen to what he was saying. I am told, again, not my authority, that there are verses that he's citing. He is commemorating the fallen, all of the fallen. Uh, there are some interpretations I've seen on the Internet that he is uh, condemning the Americans, the infidels. Again, I'm, it's not my expertise, but what we have been told on good authority is he is commemorating all of our falling and condemning the enemy. And, but I understand Things are subject to interpretation, sir, but and that is who was speaking. And that was one of the points that I, I think was particularly sensitive that was um, I, I, under public scrutiny about the entire incident. Um, uh, for, first of all, I, I can tell you that uh, having reviewed the records, those uh, uh, the pilots that were operating this aircraft are exceptional uh, quality, skill, and high rating. Uh, but there was about why was there no pre-assault fire laid down before uh, as this helicopter was coming in. Could you help clarify that, Mr. Reed? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, the use of pre-assault fires is a tactical decision based on conditions on the ground. The objective of Extortion 17 was to get in the LZ and drop off the assault force and depart the area without alerting the enemy overtly, uh, I think as we explained uh, to you the other day. The, the force was going to then walk closer to the, uh, to the target. So you're trying to achieve surprise. 11. One of the concerns that is uh, in the questions about the Afghans that were on this helicopter, there was a, some allegations that uh, there were Afghans on the, on the helicopter, I should say, uh, and then got off and a different group got on, which begs an awful lot of questions. Can you help clarify that, please? Yes, sir, thank you. There are two groups of Afghans assigned to this task force. One group went on the first target with the Rangers. The second group was on Extortion 1-7. There was a mistake made after the crash to retrieve the list of Afghans that were aboard 1-7. The, 
the list that was provided was for the other squad that was with the Rangers. This created this confusion and led to some speculation that there was a switching out of the actual forces. That is not the case, sir. What, why were there Afghans on the plane, and, and, and what kind of experience did we have with these people, or I keep saying plane, on the helicopter? Uh, what kind of experience did we have? How many times of missions have they done in the past? Was this a new group? What what? Can you provide some context there, please? Yes, sir. This group of Afghans we refer to as our partner unit, and they have been aligned with our assault forces uh, since two, going back to 2009. The purpose of these forces is to uh, facilitate actions on the objective, primarily by uh, speaking with and dealing with the enemy and the civilians on the target because they, they speak the language and they know the culture. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, the majority of these missions since we started doing this result in, a, in a, what we call a tactical call out saying we're out here, come out. And 80% of the missions therefore, because of this capability, are accomplished without any shots being fired. So it greatly enhances our safety. That is why they were there. How they got there is through a, a very long and extensive training cycle that lasts about seven months. They're hand selected out of the Afghan army and Afghan police and their other security services. They're vetted, trained, and selected, and then aligned with our units. They're paired. This, uh, uh, this review, and one of the questions is why there were, it appears there were no Afghans that were interviewed. Why not? Uh, sir, I don't know specifically why uh, no Afghans were interviewed. The focus of his investigation and the list of questions that the commander of CENTCOM charged him to answer did not require him to interview uh, others outside our decision chain and our, our training and equipping chain. Uh, perhaps you could provide some additional clarification for the committee. That would be appreciated. I want to go back to the, to the one more topic, and then if any members have additional questions. Um, you know, the, 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 the people out there uh, who are paying attention and care about Extortion 1-7, they didn't just make this thing up about a black box being washed away. Uh, that wasn't just something that somebody made up out of the blue. There is some some reason to believe that the, uh, I'm not sure what his uh, rank is, but the commander essentially on the ground uh, made note of the fact that they were looking for this black box and they couldn't find the fact of a black box. And Again, you're telling us, uh, Mr. Reed, that these helicopters aren't even equipped with them, but how is it the commander would know that? Sir, I can't speak exactly for what the commander thought. I, I have seen the transcript where he talked about looking for it. I would say, though, that this crash environment is a hostile environment, and uh, we did not have complete freedom of action, freedom of thought, and what we were what we're doing, what we're what we're looking for. That team went in there in the immediate uh, uh, moments after the crash to recover the fallen, as I indicated, over a period of four days going through the wreckage. Uh, I don't know why they thought they would be looking for one. 